Good afternoon, uh, gift teachers and speakers and committee on education. This is the third session of the virtual uh, gift uh, 2022. And I welcome you to a, a, the a continuation of the topics on, that we're dealing with on how the planet shapes the history. And we have some very exciting talks and a demonstration today. Uh, we have a minute or two uh, before we're scheduled to start. And I was thinking that this is uh, conference is being dedicated as a tribute to a, our amazing uh, chairperson who uh, Chris was, uh, he was a very humble, but he was very passionate about uh, education and outreach to the community. And we saw that with all of his ideas and working with him. You know, one of my fond memories of him is being at the IEA and he's on one side of the center and I'm with another group of teachers we're both demonstrating a hands-on uh, thing. But you know, it, it also occurred to me that I know that at the beginning we talked about gift itself and uh, European gift, as you, you knew a little bit about this, now it was an outgrowth of a uh, idea that came from the AGU where Carlo and I were actually on this committee for the Committee on Education and Human Resources. And while that, it never received the kinds of support that the EGU was giving us. And, you know, and I reflected on this yesterday that our really, our, our debt uh, for having such great success, because we had far more challenges here, you know, as it transitioned over. And so I'm talking about going from 2000, I'd like to say 2001, where Paula and I were working with AGU in San Francisco, and they were a local, they didn't have support from AGU, even getting their registrations paid. And so it was just amazing how little support they got. They had donuts and coffee, you know, for, bre uh, for breakfast, and that was about it. And here we, we have a great debt to the EGU. And I'd like to say it again, but Arnold Richter uh, was such a great enthusiast for uh, education. So our 20 years of success really go back to EGU and the great support that they had, you know, financially, which at the AGU, while they continue to have gift. We have a location for keeping our talks uh, all in order, and you can refer to those. And the talks that are going to be recorded today are also going to be available to all of you. And that's something that has never occurred really for the AGU. And so the great success of 20 years, we really owe a, a debt uh, to the EGU and Arndt Richter because he was passionate about young scientists and also having uh, the gift workshops. So uh, uh, while uh, very, very grateful to EGU for our success um, as uh, uh, with the gift workshops. So today uh, we are very fortunate to have these uh, three uh, presentations, talks this morning. And the focus today is on, I would uh, say that it's more urban uh, in environments and uh, and it's, uh, I think Costas, you told, uh, told me that, you know, for the most part, when we look at the Earth's influence on history, uh, of, uh, that we talked about the Earth's his, uh, Earth, and the, the cities are really successful. So we, we tend to think about the disasters uh, for the cities rather than the successes. So this is not a meeting about the successes of the Earth, but it's more about the disasters. And we're going to hear a lot more about that later on, on uh, later on when we talk about volcanoes and glaciers and other events that shaped the human history. But so this morning, uh, in, I'm here in the United States, it's about eight o'clock and, and the afternoon for you will involve uh, some uh, discussion and a, uh, about seismic and you'll see a hands-on activity with Jean-Luc, uh, and then we're going to take a short break at about 3.25 your time and, and uh, coming back and you're going to uh, hear from Carlo, who is passionate about uh, his exploration of Machu Picchu. And then we'll end the day with Yannick Devos uh, on urban geoarchaeology in Belgium. So we have a full uh, 
lineup for you today. And this is being recorded. So if you wanna go back and refer to the talks, uh, you'll be available starting next week. And with that, I will turn the microphone over to Jean-Luc and uh, for your hands-on presentation. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I need to, to be co-host to, to be able to share my screen, I guess. Uh, I am making you, you are a host. Uh, okay. 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 Um, I think it's okay. Uh, can you see my screen? I guess. Perfect. Yes. Okay. And I need uh, maybe to. Uh, so, uh, well, let me welcome all of the teacher for this afternoon. Uh, of course, uh, we are going to speak about Rome City in the old time, and mostly we are going to try to make a hands-on activity about the seismic site effect illustrated in the city of Rome. Uh, of course, um, oh, of course, before, let me quickly introduce myself because I'm not sure that I know everyone uh, during the meet this meeting. Well, I am teacher, so I'm going to speak and to present uh, hands-on activity uh, using that you can use uh, directly at school. So it's the reason why I'm going to show you very simple tools to use at school. Um, I am also leading uh, for a long time now the seismology school network in France. It's also the reason why I am going to show you some hands-on activity about uh, seismology. And I am a member of a team, education team in a research lab um, from the University of Côte d'Azur where I live. And for that reason, I am involved today in uh, EduMed Observatory, that is a, uh, one of the platform that we are going to use this afternoon during the hands-on. So maybe you will have to use with me uh, this, uh, this web platform. I am also leading uh, Insight Education, that is uh, the education chapter of a scientist uh, expedition and exploration on Mars. This is a exploration with a seismometer uh, on Mars. So from 2018, the seismometer uh, worked directly in on Mars and we learn a lot about the structure of the red planet. And I am a deputy chair of the committee of education of EGU. So for today, let us practice as we can <laughs> with Zoom because uh, hands-on activity with Zoom for me is not uh, very, not very fun. Uh, and I guess it's the same maybe for you because it would be very nice to practice by yourself. So I'm going to run this session uh, step by step. The step one is I'm going to show you with some slides uh, the case study and I'm going to explain the case study with some slides like a, a presentation. In the second step, we will do together the data mining online in real time. So I will ask to you to do the same thing as I do directly on, the, on your computer. It will take a little more time, but I think it's necessary to, to practice and so to use the data mining directly uh, by yourself. And for the first step, I will show you uh, some experiment that you can do in the classroom uh, to illustrate this case study. And we will make together some conclusion about the, the contents of a presentation and maybe also for the use of a 
of this presentation of this case study in schools. Okay, so as I said before, the hands-on workshop is about the seismic site effect. And I'm going to illustrate this uh, topic with the old Roman treasure that we can find. Uh, if we go to Rome city, you can see, and you are going to, see, and you can see this monument. And we will uh, focus um, on two specific monuments, that is two columns. One column is the columns of Mark Aurelius, and the other one is the Trajan um, column. They were built in the second century, so uh, and they are still there in Rome, and you, everyone who visits Rome can see these two uh, columns. So as I said before, step one, I just show you explain how to use, how to, to, to lead the case study. So we are speaking about two columns. Uh, they are located in two separate points in the city. They are something like 30 meter high, and uh, we can see uh, on this column some bas relief uh, showing battle scene and uh, groups of enemy uh, defeated during the war. Uh, fought by the Roman. So, these two columns, you have the, the photography of these two columns, and, and you have a photo photograph of the bas relief of these two columns. So, the construction of this monument requi required the use of very complex uh, techniques. It was to superimpose, as you can see, marble blocks. One number of blocks is something like 40 tones, so it's quite heavy. And, they, and it was also to make, uh, to coincide uh, perfectly the blocks, one with the other, taking in account of two things. The first thing, it was to taking account of the relief, uh, which were prob probably already sketched and gradually finished during the construction. And the other, point, other things, it was also to taking in account the, the interior spiral uh, staircase, which had to be dug into the blocks before they were placed. So it is complex to do. And you can see the two colon, uh, and you can see the two bas -relief. Now, this is my first question. It's a question of observation. I am doing a hands-on activity, so maybe the first step is to ask questions and making some observation. Of course, as I said, I, I show you things very simple. Uh, if we can examine the barrelief of this colon, you can see an anomaly in one of them. I think you have found it. Uh, in this Marc Aurelius column, you, if you look specifically to the bas relief, you can see that the shift, so the bas relief is not coinciding very perfectly. And we guess that at, at the moment when the column was made, the bas relief was completely and correctly done. So that means that the shift is. Uh, uh, younger than the, the construction of a column. Something happens to explain this shift. So we, ha we have now to try to make some hypothesis to explain uh, what happened with this bas relief. So these two columns have the same age. So they are built in the second century. And they are not very far. So the, the distance between the two columns in, uh, in Rome city is something like 600 meters. So Marc Aurelius is a little in the north, uh, Trajan is a little in the south, but very, very close. The two columns are very close. And so my hypothesis, one of the hypotheses can be this one. 
two days ago, Grant Hiken in the session one uh, spoke about this. He spoke about strong earthquakes uh, after the second century in Rome. So if strong earthquakes occurred in that period, they should have affected the stability of a Cologne and particularly the Cologne of Mark Aurelius. And so if this fact is verified, it will be necessary to explain why the Trian Cologne was much less affected by the earthquake, if I compare with Mark Aurelius. So my hands-on activity is to go through this hypothesis and to find some conclusion about this. What about the seismicity in Italy? Because we are speaking about earthquake. Well, if you collect, actually, in the, time, the seismicity of Italy, you can see that Italy, there is a lot of earthquake in Italy. And you can see in the yellow circle, this is the area of, uh, of Rome, and larger than Rome, you can see that earthquakes occurred in this area, and strong earthquake can also occur along the Italian uh, uh, country. And so that means that today, uh, Italy know very well a seismic event. And in the past, and well, if you, if you look at Twitter, for example, you have uh, news, news after news, and when a, an earthquake is uh, strong enough, you have a, a breaking news on ENGV uh, uh, ter Teremoti, or ENGV Teremoti from, uh, e from on Twitter, and you can have some uh, alert, some alarm about uh, an earthquake in that uh, region. As I said, Grant Aiken, um, Monday, uh, I've shown this picture. We've also, uh, what about the, uh, the past earthquake? And we know that there, is, there were also strong earthquake in the, in, the past, uh, in the past. And also we know that these earthquakes, and he has shown this Monday too, this, uh, in the past, uh, we have a lot of damage in the city uh, because of this uh, earthquake. And so our hypothesis can be good if we, according of this, uh, of these things, uh, earthquakes occurred in Italy on the recent time, in the past time, and we have also some uh, proxy direct, directly in the city uh, when we know that there is a lot of damages because of the earthquakes. So maybe we can explore what happened with uh, the Trajan and Mark Aurelius uh, column. In fact, because of, uh, of this, uh, because of this seismicity in Italy and, and also in the, in, the, in the capital town of, uh, the, city, of the country, uh, ENGV uh, has some uh, permanent and non-permanent seismic network. You can see on this map, uh, red mark. This red mark are a sensor, are a seismometer, or more exactly accelerometer, uh, play located in the city, and the number or to identify the, the sensor, it, it was a, a number. So you have NR25, NR16, NR7, NR1, and you see that the, the sensor are located in different place uh, ar along the Tiber uh, River, as you can see here, maybe I'm going to use my... Uh, Okay, so you can see the Tiber here, and we are uh, in Rome city, and you have a lot of uh, sensor. 
So it's completely useful to, to record earthquake, local earthquake, regional earthquake, or far away earthquake. So in my example, in my case study, we are going to we are going to study. Uh, we are going to study an earthquake that occurred not very well last last year uh, in Greece. It was a strong earthquake, and it was recorded uh, on a lot of uh, sensors, not only in Italy, but we are going to see the record of this earthquake in this uh, red station that uh, I show you on the map. And so for this, I need to collect data or to make a data mining on the web to look at the seismogram recorded by uh, by the station when occurred this earthquake. So for this, I need to go. Uh, I need to go uh, to a web platform where I can find this kind of data and to see what is this data can show me uh, some aspect. So this is uh, why. I, oops, sorry. So I propose to you, if you are uh, there, I don't know uh, if you are, follow me. Uh, if there is some difficulties for you to follow me, please uh, ask um, right in the chat. And then uh, Teresita will, will say to me, uh, will tell me if there is some, uh, some question of some uh, hesitation, but what I would want is that everyone can go directly uh, with this computer, with this computer, directly on this web page. So edumed.unis.fr data center slash seismo. And we are going to make the activity directly together not with a slide, but directly on the web. So I'm going to, to close to share my screen. I come back to you. Jean-Luc, leave the, the link uh, a little bit more. Yes, I'm going, yeah, I'm going to copy the link in the chat. Okay. Right? Because it will, be, it will be easier, easier to... So if you if you click on the on this as I'm and now I'm going to share my screen to show you the page. So okay. Uh, I think you can see the screen now. It's not my slide, it's directly the website. If someone can tell me if you can see the, the screen with uh, the web page. Yes, yes, we can. Good. So uh, this is a, a French website, but most of the, the most important uh, words are also in English. So what I try to do is to find data, so seismogram, about this uh, earthquake occurred in Greece and recorded in Rome. So I'm not looking at this uh, day plot that you can see with me because it's the real time now. So I'm just going to select this uh, part. Uh, this is seismogram. So I click on seismogram and at I go in that page where there is a, a French part and an English part. And so I can click on English part. And then I am directly on the website, a list, so a database, if you prefer, a list of earthquake 
with, uh, for which we consider that the seismogram are interesting to use at school. So it's a seismogram with a pedagogic interest for teachers. So it's that, that reason I show you this website because you will maybe, you will have the opportunity to, to explore more and more the data on this website. So I try to find uh, an earthquake occurred in Greece and recorded in Rome. And it was in March, 2021. Mm -hmm. And I can see this data, earthquake occur in Greece, recorded in Rome. I guess everybody can be there. And mm -hmm. so now I have two choice, download the file in a zip format. So that means that I'm going to download data, but data without software to analyze data is not very interesting because you are not downloading pictures or images. You are downloading the numeric, the digital file. So that means that you need a software to analyze data. If you have this software of one software, and there is a lot of uh, software, you can only download the zip file. But if you have not the software, I can recommend you to display the data directly with the software. And this software is free, is directly working on the web, and we call him it Tectoglob 3D. So I click on display with Tectoglob 3D. And when I do this, Tectoglob open, you have the English version because you were in the English part of the website. And then you, have, you can see on the left side, a map. Mm -hmm. The map, uh, you have uh, the south of Europe with Italy, with Greece, Greece. Uh, okay. and on the left, on the right side, you have seismograph. But it's not, uh, of course, it's picture, but it's uh, digital uh, data. Uh, for example, with uh, my uh, with my uh, mouse, uh, I can uh, enlarge the that the seismogram. You can see, so I can have a zoom directly. Uh, and I can also move the seismogram in each direction just to, uh, to be able to read them correctly. So uh, if I am not very, uh, maybe I have to improve the background, the scientific background about the, the seismogram. So we have one earthquake is the red point that you have on the map. The red point is the epicenter. We know where this earthquake occurred. This is the epicenter in Greece, in continental Greece. In the, the white point, NR7, it's the place where we have our seismometer. So if I enlarge the map with my mouse, I can see that this is not one point, but two points. I am going to work on two different accelerometer, the number one and the number seven. So we are in Roma, but the map is not very nice, okay? So you can uh, improve the map asking a satellite image. So on the top of the map, you have a, a little signal. And if you click on this signal, the map will be directly improve like I have done on my computer. So I think you can find it. Uh, so you have a, a little signal to, to improve the map because we, we have made a zoom. So we are in Rome, no trouble with this. We can see the Tiber uh, Valley and we have two accelerometer, number seven and number one. They are very close and they are so close that the two points are completely similar. If you 
according the distance with the Greek uh, earthquake. So that means that we can expect we can expect that on these two seismometers we must have the same data because we have the same distance and it seems that the seismometers are so close that we can imagine that the, the data, the seismogram will be the, the ground motion in this place are the same. So now we are going to look at the seismogram on the right side. I go slowly with you because my objective is that you can follow and that you can do by yourself this uh, and not only uh, listening uh, a presentation. Uh, it is an hands-on activity on Zoom, so of course I can not help you directly with your computer, but I hope you can follow this step. So now I am looking at the seismogram on the right side. So on the right side, I can see uh, on the top the output window, I can see the reference of the, the earthquake. So that, that means the date, magnitude, depth, epicenter, and uh, the red point show the epicenter. And now we have two stations, station NR1, station NR7. The station uh, are uh, completely uh, integrated to the network of ENGV. So I have a localization of this station and I have also the distance, the distance between NR1 and NR7. So it's quite the same, it's 841, 44 kilometers. And after we have for each station, you have three components. So uh, maybe you are not uh, familiar with this. The seismometer um, record the ground motion in three direction. Uh, if you see the letter Z, that means that it is the, the component who re which record the vertical movement. So the, the ground is moving up and down and the component of the seismometer which record this is the number Z, the letter Z. So the, the la the, this, uh, this record uh, is the vertical movement. If you see E or N, that means that it is the horizontal movement E means, means movement, motion east to west, and N north means north to south. So you can see uh, all the, the ground motion east west, it is the first seismogram, north south, it is the second one, and vertical, it is the third one. This is for one station for NR1, but if you if I go Below, I can see the second one, so for NR7. Okay, so of course, I, I can compare the ground motion in the place of the station number one and the station number seven. But before comparing the seismogram, I must be sure that the scale is the same. And the computer, doesn't give you the same scale. He's using uh, uh, his uh, parameter to show you in the best way the seismogram. So if you want to compare, you have to fix the same scale. So you have to go below in settings window, and you can see in settings window that there is, uh, you have to check and uh, to fix the same scale on uh, what uh, axis? And if I do this now, when I fix the same scale for the amplitude, I can see some difference be be because now I can compare the two seismograms because I am with the same 
scale. And when I look at this, I see I can compare things very well. And I see that something is quite strange because if I look at the station number one, the amplitude on each component are very low if I compare with the amplitude of the station number seven. And the station are at the same place. Uh, the station one is closer than uh, to the earthquake to the other one. So uh, the amplitude is lower. So something is wrong. Well, is wrong because when we are teacher and when we speak to the student, we say that with the distance, the seismic waves propagate and decrease the amplitude, the energy decrease along the distance. And then here, I, am not, I have not the same amplitude for this uh, seismogram. So there is something strange. Uh, I can uh, improve my uh, lecture, my observation of a seismogram, because I have in the menu, I can display a lot of uh, information. So you go to seismogram in the menu. So you have file, action, seismogram, and data displayed in seismogram. You can display the origin time. So if I do this, I have a green uh, axis. This is the time, this is the, the date, exactly the date of the earthquake. So of course, the T, the origin time is before the arrival of the waves but you can also ask to display the waves a river time. So you have the P waves, the S wave, and the longitudinal, uh, the low uh, waves. So that means that you can display the arrival time for the, the P waves, the S wave. So you see that the P waves, a river time for the P waves, so S wave is the same. So the amplitude can be explained by something else. So I see that when I compare, I see there is the big difference. And maybe the big difference between the three is the movement north south. If I look the if I I look the the component north south for the one, number one and number seven, I see that there is a big big difference with the amplitude. So the horizontal movement north south seems to be very uh, very big for the station number seven and very low for the station number one. If I want to, to put only these two seismograms, I can also display only some component like north-south. So display in the settings window, I can display only north component and so I can compare two components and I can see that there is a big difference. So the difference are mainly with the amplitude. But I can see also here that it seems that the ground motion, the vibration uh, uh, according of the waves, the duration is bigger. So it seems that the, the ground motion stay more time in uh, station seven than in station one. So this is another aspect of what happens. So in that case, I can see this difference. Okay, so uh, this is one, one, ele one uh, very important element. I think, uh, I hope you have uh, seen this, uh, correctly. Of course, I can uh, do the same with over. So I come back to, to the seismic uh, center and I can also choose. So I do the same and I can see if in the database there is or over earthquakes. So I can, I can see, I have seen, uh, in 2021, uh, the Greece earthquake, but I can see also 
but I have one in Liguri, so it is in Italy too, close to the border with France in uh, uh, September 2019. And there is the keywords of this uh, database, there is site effect. So I can, uh, well, I can experiment this too. So it's not the, the, the case of study of Rome, but it's also site effect. So I display with Tectoglobe once more time. I'm going to go a little uh, faster. So in my example here, I have an earthquake, the red point. I have three stations. Uh, if I want to uh, improve the map, I have to ask a satellite image, okay? So you have a uh, MENA station very close to Monaco, Monaco city. And after you have two other stations, NALS and GLAN, this is station uh, in the city of Nice. And on the right side, I have only the Z component for MENA, for GLAN and for NALS. So I have, if I want to compare, of course, if uh, I can display seismogram the origin time. So I can see the, the seismic waves arrived uh, in MENA first and after in GLAN and NALS. But what I want to see is to put in the same scale and I see exactly the same that before. So I have a very, very big difference between NALS and gland, these two stations are very, very close. So at the same distance to the epicenter, but the amplitude, the duration, and the frequency of the data are quite different. So in NALS, I can see a long duration, I can see a big amplitude, and then can see a very low frequency in the in the, in the waves. And if I compare with GLAN, it's completely different. So that means, as we have seen with in Rome, we have a big difference between two stations. These two stations here in Nice are, and maybe it's uh, what I want to, to see, NALS, where there is the big amplitude, the low frequency of a big duration is completely in the lower part of the city, very flat zone, and gland is on the rock, on the rock, on the uh, limestone, limestone of, uh, on the Alp. And so gland is not on the same geological place than Nals. Okay, so now I'm going to, coming back to my, uh, to my slide, as I said before. So we were, uh, oops. Okay. So we were uh, here and we, we have uh, compared the data in Roma recording from Greek uh, in two stations. Oh, uh, no, sorry. Don't know what happened. Okay. Can you see the slide now? Yes? No? Yes, yes. Okay. So this is slide. This, they are not the website now. So uh, it is a, a copy of a screen. We have seen this. So we have seen that the two stations has not the same amplitude. And if I come back to the geologic map, I see that there is a big difference between the two stations, the number one and the number seven. The number one is uh, on this green uh, part of the geologic map, and this is volcanic uh, deposit and sandstone deposit. So very concrete rock. And the number seven is in the, Deposit alluvion, alluvional 
uh, alluvion deposit uh, on the Tiber River in, the, in this blue uh, part of the, of the geologic map. So the geologic uh, bedrock uh, where the, the sensors are located are not the same. So if you, and if you see, you, and if you compare the seismogram, you see that the amplitude, the frequency, the duration is not the same. And we have one explication is that uh, the fact, the geological uh, aspect of uh, outcrop can be uh, important. And the, motion, the ground motion is not the same on uh, deposit, uh, alluvional uh, deposits from the river or directly on the concrete rock. So it was the same for, for the French-Italian uh, border. Uh, we have seen that clan is on the rock, limestone, and Nalts were in alluvial deposit with a, a, a site, it is what we call site effect. And when I am teacher, Usually, uh, I explain to the student that if I am uh, far from the epicenter or close to the epicenter, the intensity is not the same. It is right, so you can tell this to the student, but in fact, you have also to consider that you speak with a homogeneous uh, uh, crust. But if you have not the same rock along in your area, you can be surprised with the effect of, uh, of the waves uh, according of a geological uh, aspect. So the intensity decrease with the, uh, with the distance if the, if the crust is homogeneous, but in fact, it's not the same always. Uh, for example, this is a, a Mediterranean uh, earthquake in the, in the area of Nice. So on the left part, it is what we, could, we can, uh, we can uh, imagine if there is an earthquake. The earthquake, if this earthquake occurs, uh, I will have the strong effect in the city of Nice, and then an effect uh, less and less and less with uh, concentric uh, uh, circle. But when I look at what really happened, so when we have testimony of people or if we have testimony because we have done observation on the field, we see, and you can see with me on the right map, the red curve show the place where the, the ground motion was bigger. And so you can see that, well, uh, there is a, a bigger effect uh, in very close to the epicenter, but you have also some place where the, the ground motion was strong enough to have testimony from people or some uh, destruction. And you can see that we have not this concentric uh, aspect and we have more, some place seems to feel the waves more than other places. So that means that maybe we have to go to the geological map or to the urbanization and to see what happens in this area. Another example is uh, uh, that one. This is uh, uh, an earthquake in the Alps and you see that we have no concentric aspect and you have a very complex uh, uh, macro seismic map. That means that the effect of the earthquake and the testimony are quite different between one area to another one. This is what we call uh, size effect, another one that I go through. So this is what happens, seismic waves propagation. Well, the, wa the waves decrease, decrease, decrease with a distance. But when the waves, uh, for some places, for some site, we have uh, amplification of the, of the ground motion. And it is what we have to, to understand. 
Okay, so uh, data we have exp we we explore data and we have seen what uh, what happened with the data. The data show that we have not the same record in uh, two places according of a geologic place uh, where the sensors are located. So when you are when we are in a, a alluvial deposit, it seems that we have a big amplitude of the waves. And when we are in a, uh, in a concrete rock, we have uh, the waves are completely uh, uh, decreased. You can, with students, you can make a simple experiment at school to show and to experiment what happens. So you have here uh, a the device that the, the students have made by themselves. So this is a, a wooden beam allowed out. So they have made a, 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 little, uh, a little place and they fill this place with, uh, they can fill with uh, candle wax, uh, jello, or if you have nothing like this, you can use uh, sand uh, or sand with a little water. And so you put these two things, so you have a, and you can use a microphone that we call piezoelectric cell. I will explain to you uh, how to uh, put this experiment uh, at, at school. They put the one microphone on the wood and the other microphone on the wax. And now I am, I hope it's working. I am a little, uh, video to show you this. Can you see the video? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Well, it seems uh, quite simple to do this, and it is, and it is. So you need uh, you need just some uh, some element to do this. You need a piezo cell. So this is what what is piezo cell? They are microphone. You can find this in electronic uh, shop. You need two of them because you you have to to plug the two uh, piezo cell. Uh, directly with uh, a cable, uh, audio cable, directly in the computer. You have to link to the line in because uh, you need two signals and two independent signals. So you need two microphones and you need to plug these two microphones by in the same uh, in the same plug that we call line in, and then you will need to use a software that we call Audacity. Audacity is a free uh, software, so you can find on the web the Audacity and you can um, download it. And then you have just to record data and to look the difference between the two microphones. And so you have two signal, to independent signal, and so you can compare what happens on the microphone number one and the microphone number two. Of course, you need also to prepare your your wood and uh, your wax or jello or sand to do the side effect. 
So we have seen that the amplitude is not the same, so it's okay. And now you can also uh, imagine if the amplitude is not the same, uh, if the, the frequency is not the same, if the duration is not the same, which is the effect on the building. So for the building, you can do simple or more complex uh, experiment to, to show this kind of things. So uh, on this video, uh, you can see uh, uh, a model, an experiment with a, a building made uh, very simple. This building uh, are on the, on, on the plate and this plate will, move, will be moved by, by sound, um, by a, a speaker, but you can also move this plate uh, by yourself with your hand. And the idea is to move the, the plate and this uh, table, vib vibrating table, to move with beginning with a, a low frequency, increasing the frequency, or decreasing the lake frequency and look at the building, what happens. So let's go for the video. We begin with a low frequency. And you can see that it's not always the building which is uh, vibrating because of the frequency. And when we are in a high frequency, you see the, the small uh, building uh, moving. And then we decrease the frequency. And now we can see that we go again and we see the vibration of a, a higher uh, building. So we can see that the frequency of the, uh, of the ground motion can have an effect on the building. Uh, if this kind of experiment is too difficult for you to, uh, to, to make at school, uh, you can also use a, a just a, a piece of wood and you make this uh, free building, free stem, you put a mass on, uh, on each stem and you make a vibration of, uh, of the wood and you will see when you shake the, the wood quickly, it will be the, the smaller building which move. And if you shake the plate uh, slowly, it will be the, the, old, uh, the, the highest building. So in fact, it's, uh, it's what we call the resonance frequency. And there is some, uh, there is from a mathematic formula to, to see if we know the, the resonance frequency on the ground motion and, and, and we can expect and we can imagine which building will be moved more than the other one. So uh, this is what we can, you, you cannot do uh, easily. So it's the reason why I show you by slide in the research center, we, we make this kind of diagram. This diagram show, well, it's not com complex, but it's difficult to, to draw uh, by yourself. So the idea is to show you uh, the frequency. It's in Hertz, uh, okay? In, uh, and the other axis is the relation between the amplitude, the horizontal, the amplitude of the horizontal movement um, according with uh, vertical movement. So the, if I look at the station number one, I have uh, always the same uh, curve, uh, H, H, V, and, um, and the frequency. But if I look at the station number seven, I see that there is something strange. I, if I compare with the number one, I have a very high peak. Uh, this high peak is uh, at 0 0.9 uh, Hertz. So at this frequency, 
it seems that the horizontal movement is very big if I compare with the vertical movement. So that means that at 0 0.9, with 0 0.9 Hertz, uh, the ground motion, the horizontal ground motion will be very high. And so there is the, the resonant frequency of the building is, uh, if I make the, the calculation with this on the station number seven, I see that it's not uh, 11 stairs, but 11 floors, no? sorry, uh, I make a mistake. So 11 floor is something like 27, 28 meters. So 28 meters uh, for the station seven. So that means that in Rome at the place where there is the station seven, everything with 28, 30 meters high can be uh, shaked uh, and nicely shaked by the earthquake. Uh, back to our colon, the Marcorel and Trian colon is something like 30 meters. So we are just very close to the, uh, to the, for the, the height of the colon, uh, which is the, the resonance frequency. Back again for the Roman colon, you have the geological map. You have a place now where the colon are. Of course, uh, I, I give you this information on Linai because it's, uh, it can be interesting to, to do this now. So you can see that the colon, uh, the Trian colon is on sand and uh, volcanic rocks. So very concrete element. Even if, very, if this colon is very close to Mark uh, Aurel colon. And in fact, uh, the Mark Aurel colon is a sandy alluvial deposit. And so that means that the, the movement will be higher. And it's for that reason that we have seen this shift in the bar relief. So the, the Mark Aurel colon was shaked enough to, to move a little this very big block of marble. And now we have uh, this shift that we can see. It is, well, an archeological uh, proxy for, for the, the earthquake. Of, of course, I cannot uh, calculate the magnitude of this earthquake, but I can see the, that this colon was uh, shaked by the earthquakes and Trian colon uh, didn't move a lot because of, uh, and of course, the, the, the earthquake who, which has done this is one of these strong earthquakes of the second uh, century. And of course, now uh, Rome has to consider this. Rome uh, city has to consider this because every day new building. Uh, uh, new buildings are necessary to, to welcome the population. And so that means that now uh, in, the city, in, the, in the area of Roma, uh, there is a, a urban uh, area which increased and increased year by year. So that means that uh, people and uh, authority has to consider this aspect of size, seismic effect to, to see uh, where and uh, which kind of building we have to, to build uh, along the Tiber River, along the Tiber Valley, and where it's more appropriate to, um, to welcome the population. So it can be important to, to consider the site effect. It can be, it, it is important in every, every big uh, city, uh, if I, if I have, and I have time enough to, to speak about the Mexico City, it's a mega city, as you know, in South America. And uh, a lot of earthquake occurred there also. And uh, the city is very vulnerable to the earthquakes. For example, in 1985, uh, there was a very big, a very strong earthquake, magnitude 8.2. So very strong, and it destroyed the, the city. You have some picture of this uh, destruction. You see a lot of people who try to, 
to search uh, other people to to help to to do something and you can see also some building completely collapse and some other one uh, not collapse and they are very close together so um, if i consider this uh, earthquake the earthquake occurred usually on the on the pacific uh, subduction zone so for example in that example you have the the epicenter was on the coast of um, of uh, mexico and so the waves are going to travel everywhere and especially uh, in direction of the Mex city, Mexico City. And you have in this uh, picture, uh, you have uh, the seismogram. And you see that at the beginning, the amplitude and the frequency, the amplitude is very high and the, the frequency is very uh, um, short. And then when we go to Mexico, we, which is at 400 kilometers, so far away, the, the the seismogram show amplitude decreasing and decreasing and decreasing but if you compare UNAM just on the volcanic uh, bedrock and the SCT which is another sensor directly on the sedimentary uh, deposit you can see a big difference between the two ones so of course uh, if I compare UNAM and NCT, the two seismograms are completely different. Of course, inside the Mexico City, the ground motion was completely different but in the border. And all the and the building in Mexico City were completely shaked by a very high amplitude, very low frequency. So we have to calculate the resonance to see which building uh, were collapsed or not. And the duration also. So that means that the duration uh, is big. So the building shaked, uh, shakes a long time. And so is more vulnerable if it, it shakes a long time. And if yeah, we go back to the, if, if we go back to the picture and if we go back to the experiment, you see that you can explain that why some buildings are not were not collapsed and the other one yes because there was a resonance frequency a particular one and all the building with a specific height uh, were collapsed and not the other one and in that case in Mexico it was not the highest it was, it was not the lowest but it was in the middle all the building in the middle eight were uh, collapsed uh, because of the, of this vibration and if we go back to the geology uh, we have to we have to come back 700 years ago and we see and we understand that uh, mexico city like uh, venice in italy uh, was built on a lake and on the land where there is a lake. So that means that uh, all this area where the Mexico City is, is directly built on the uh, sedimentary deposit um, of this old lake. And so, of course, if you look at the seismic zoning, and so that means that by color we we try to evaluate uh, the risk and the maximum risk. You see that we have a, a red zone. So the red zone uh, means that the risk is maximum. So that means that an earthquake occurred. The the ground movement, the ground motion will be very high and uh, with a very specific frequency and so this place uh, can be uh, difficult and especially vulnerable and you have zona uh, in gray or in yellow where it was not the lake before and so of course the, the situation is 
a little better for the for the building. So you can understand the seismic effect by the properties of the waves and the geological aspect. So you make geophysics and geology at the same time. It's necessary to understand things. So you can make geophysics, geology, and also engineering, and you have all the, the package to understand uh, the vulnerability of the city because of, uh, of the earthquakes. And you can understand also uh, which, which ki this kind of uh, uh, sis sis seismic alert uh, in Mexico. So Mexico understood that the earthquake occur uh, on the coast. The waves will travel uh, until Mexico. And then in Mexico, we will have a seismic effect. So if we can know before the arrival of the seismic waves, uh, that the seismic waves are arriving, and so we have a, a, a system to uh, record the epicenter uh, with a seismometer uh, located on the coast. So the seismometer records the waves, and after with a signal which go faster than the, the seismic waves, of course, we make an alarm in the Mexico to alert the, well, the, the authority that uh, big seismic waves arrived in Mexico City. And so we can maybe close uh, uh, as, uh, stop the traffic of the trains or things like that, just to reduce the vulnerability of the earthquake. So to resume and to conclude uh, this, so this is what you can uh, keep with your student as a, a synthetic uh, diagram. So if we consider only the S waves, and it is interesting to consider the S wave because the S wave is the horizontal, uh, the, the, when they arrived on the surface of, uh, of the ground, they make, uh, they produce horizontal movement. This is the S waves. And so we have a reference station. The reference station is always in a concrete rock and bedrock. So we have a seismogram for the reference station in black in my, uh, in my figure. And then you have some uh, uh, increase of the amplitude, frequency decrease, duration uh, increase. This is, this is site effect. And you can have size effect in several uh, situations. Uh, for example, when you have a large thickness of sediments in green on the right part of the, of the diagram. So it's the case of the major of the big city in the world, because when you, this big city um, built all the, the houses and uh, the population join uh, this place very flat uh, with a lot of sediment. So if you are living in a seismic area, you will have a, a big seismic uh, event. It can be a sedimentary basin. So it is quite the same uh, phenomenon than the, the, the large thickness of sediment. And you have also a topographic, uh, a topography uh, site effect. So the waves, uh, stay in the mountains and, and make the mountains uh, move, uh, shaking uh, a long time and making some uh, increase, increase of, uh, of the amplitude. This is, don't, this is all the this, uh, seismic aspect. So you have seen that uh, in Roma, in the old movement monument, we can uh, find uh, some uh, proxy of, uh, of this seismic site effect. And uh, you can maybe in your uh, area when, where you live, when you teach, maybe you will have 
some example like that one, which will illustrate for, this, for your student this very important uh, aspect of the seismology and uh, for the citizen seismology. So the site effect, the importance of the geology and the, and the buildings. And it's very important because in the future, we hope that this element will be uh, important to build new cities uh, for the future. Thank you very much. And if you have some question, please do not hesitate. Should we read, Teresita, are you in charge of the, the chat? Maybe I will go into the chat and see the questions and I don't. Okay, I, I will do it. A, yeah, I can see, I can see the chat, uh, Stephen. So I can, uh, uh, thank you, Teresita, to give some uh, link for the city. <laughs> and uh, well, for Tectoglobe, Tecto somebody, uh, I think it's uh, Susanna Brandao. Bon dia, Susanna. <laughs> uh, the question is, how can we determine the amplitude with Tectoglobe 3D? So uh, you, you cannot um, actually, we have no uh, implemented a, a tool to, to calculate the amplitude. So we can, we can do this, but you have a, on your left side, you have, a, uh, you have some uh, scale, so you can approximately uh, calculate the amplitude. But in the best way, we will have in the future, uh, access to, to, to look at the amplitude. But it's difficult sometimes to, to calculate the amplitude because we, are, we have to know exactly the, uh, the specificity, the, the, technical, uh, the technical aspect of the sensor. And so sometimes we cannot uh, calculate the amplitude. So we cannot uh, publish the data because we don't know exactly the, the scale of uh, the seismograph. Um, and Jaluk, we have another question. Yeah. I, I, I didn't write the name, but I read the question. How is possible to find similar data from other earthquake uh, from other recording center? So uh, you can find data uh, on, a, on a lot of uh, seismic uh, website, researcher website. Most of them are research uh, website. And this is the problem when, when you are a teacher because the, the researcher uh, center uh, publish data, but for researcher purpose, uh, not, not very often for education purpose. So uh, this is why I show you EduMed. Of course, I am in the EduMed team, so uh, I know this, but uh, you can, try to keep in touch with a research center close to your school and to ask to uh, to ask to to seismologue uh, data they, and if they provide you data in uh, in the right format for tectoglobe you will be able to use this specific data with tectoglobe too you need only to uh, ask to the scientist a uh, data in SAC, S-A-C format. And when the Tectoglobe see this uh, SAC format data, is able to open the data like I have done uh, with you. Or if you have a data, you can contact us or contact me, and we will see if we can help you to use this data with Tectoglobe. But the first step is to go and to to try to to catch a seismologue uh, close to your area to ask him some data uh, to illustrate uh, this aspect or other other things but on edumet data you can find already a lot of data with uh, greek earthquake uh, portuguese earthquake uh, italian earthquake uh, and the link with volcano and earthquake so you can find already 
a lot of, a lot of example, but the, the, the best example is the example that you will find uh, very close of your city because it will speak more for your student. Maybe one more question and then we will take our yeah. coffee break. Teresita? Uh, I found no more question on the chat. Okay. So uh, I can, uh, I say that uh, the best way if you have more questions later, so uh, contact uh, me, I can write a mail to contact me. And so that means that you will, uh, you will, uh, Ask me question if you want more. Okay, Stephen. Thanks okay. for your attention. Okay, we will take a uh, a break until three forty five, and we will reconvene uh, uh, hearing about Machu Picchu. Okay, so yeah. go get uh, your tea, your coffee, cappuccino, and we will see you back at three forty five. So uh, welcome back from the break. Uh, we are now uh, going to the first of two talks for this uh, afternoon and this morning in, in uh, Virginia. So just, I didn't introduce uh, my co-host for the, this session is Teresita Gravina. And uh, I am uh, uh, Stephen Macko. I'm a professor at the University of Virginia in uh, the Eastern United States. I teach uh, things like oceanography. And do you have a, a statement, uh, Teresita, or should we go to Carlo? I guess we will go to Carlo. So, uh, Carlo, yes. go ahead. Everybody uh, online, I see, I, I can't hear. But I think the volume is up. Anyway, uh, so uh, the rest of this afternoon's session will uh, start off by with Carlo Lage, and he will. You've heard from him yesterday uh, on, on Monday, and so I don't think he needs further introduction. But he will be talking about uh, Machu Picchu. So, Carlo, take it away. Okay, I'm on. Okay, so, so. Machu Picchu, Lost City of Incas. The title of his talk is not mine. Actually, I borrowed from a book written by Hiram Bingen, the American explorer who made Machu Picchu known to the world. It's, uh, no, sorry. His uh, discovery of Machu Picchu dates to the July 24, 1911. And this uh, plate here is at the entrance of Machu Picchu put for the 50th anniversary of the discovery. I like the date, 24th of July, because it just happens to be my birthday. But I don't think, I don't think Bingham thought of that, I was not. I was actually minus 28 years old at the time. So let me say a few words about Hiram Bingham. He was, um, when, first of all, when he discovered Machu Picchu, he was convinced he was looking for another town called, known as Vilcabamba, which is the capital city, the hidden capital city of Incas, where the Incas uh, and escaped after the Spanish conquistadors came in. And um, Iron Bingham thought that uh, Machu Picchu and Vilcabamba were the same and, and, and uh, only one, but he was wrong, and but this was proved wrong after his death. He was a uh, native of Hawaii. He was educated at Yale University in the States on the East Coast, and uh, he later taught in that university. He had a colorful career. 
including being an Air Force troop commander during, in France during World War I. He was elected senator and uh, he wrote several books about South American civilization. He died in 1956 and is buried in uh, Arlington National Cemetery. In, uh, I don't remember if it was July or June, 2021, 100 years after his recovery, I happened to be in Lima for my research work. And walking around Lima, I, I discovered a, a, let's say, an exposition of photographs and documents, open air in the street and no, no copyright. And because I had my camera with me, I tried to make a short video of this. And this short video is interesting because it shows how uh, Machu Picchu was when Hiram Bingham discovered it. And I would like to show it to you. Here is the, uh, the tale of the, uh, he left from Cusco and uh, he passed through Olantambo and before, and here is in front of his tent in Machu Picchu. He was very tall, I stood very impressed with people. And this is how he had to pass the Urubamba, Rio Urubamba in the valley below uh, Machu Picchu. And this is the view of Machu Picchu he got in the back, Wine Picchu. Machu Picchu means the old mountain, Wine Picchu is the young mountain. And uh, this is actually exactly the, the, the year he discovered Machu Picchu was covered with vegetation. This is later on when most of at least the large part of vegetation had been taken away. This is the principal temple. We'll see more of this later on in my talk. And uh, this is the man who, with a machete, had taken the vegetation out. Then there is a sacred rock with somebody standing in front of it. And this is a view which uh, what you have to look at. Oh, incidentally, this is the only round temple with a trapezoidal window. And you have to watch how nicely the different uh, construction stay together. There is no trace of cement between them. And the, the stair, for instance, is there. The vegetation is not altered, this uh, fantastic uh, look. And uh, you we can we use it to get today. So going up, when we come back to the below, we will see this place here. It's a fountain. Also admire this big wall. How nicely it has survived. Five hundred years. And uh, here is a small boy with in front of a mortar where he was crushing corn or frozen potatoes. Here is uh, Sergeant Carrasco, whom the gover governor of Cusco had asked to follow Iron Bing and both as an interpreter as an escort. And finally, in this small video, uh, we get to the three windows temple here covered with vegetation and this man proudly standing over there because he had cleaned this part. Now, next slide is taken from the top of uh, Wine Picchu. 
And looking at this, you can see that there are about 700 meters on the right side, also 700 meters to the valley. So one question which one may reasonably ask is how, why, and how, oops, did the Incas build Machu Picchu in such a remote and inaccessible place? So this isolated location is most probably linked to the religious status of Machu Picchu whose construction was altered by the Inca ruler Pachacuti about 500 years ago. But there are other reasons. In particular, there are geological reasons where, which were the determining factor for the precise choice of the location of Machu Picchu. So let's take a look at the geology of Machu Picchu. Here is a map of South America, of Saint, yeah, taken from an article by Rope Archetal, published in 2006 in Tectonics. I am, together with a student of mine, I am a co-author of this paper, which um, relates to this region here. You can see the Western Cordillera, the eastern cordillera here, and in between the two, there is uh, what is called the Abankai deflection, a deflection which happened later after the eastern and western cordilleras were built, and uh, we were working there on paleomagnetic studies to see when and how much of rotation occurred. So you know why I went to see Machu Picchu. I worked in Peru for about one or two months a year for six years, and I visited Machu Picchu six times. And every time it was a fantastic view. So let's look a little bit closer to this. Here we have the, a view of a graben. Uh, sorry, I forgot to tell you that the two folds here. The, oops. The, the, this is the Huayna Picchu fault. This is the Machu Picchu fault. And uh, I should have shown a little, a little bit more the map before, because uh, uh, everything is stuck. I don't know what happened. You know, okay. So let's go back to this. Sorry, I skipped this. There are two major faults. This is the city of Machu Picchu, the Machu Picchu fault and the Huayna Picchu fault. Both are normal faults, so that the center part has, uh, uh, has gone down. Here is, uh, please notice this, there is a primary spring, which is very important, as I will tell you later. And this is the, the Block dragon of a graben on which the city of Machu Picchu was built. As early as uh, 1987, a researcher from Peru working at Berkeley uh, did a study, a remote sensing study of the Machu Picchu region, and he um, mapped down fracture and faults. This is the figure 11 of his publication. And so he could see that uh, some of his faults were uh, parallel to the Machu Picchu or Huayna Picchu faults, but there is a second family almost at uh, right angle, so that uh, they made an X, X 
right at the place where Machu Picchu was built. This was also confirmed later on by a, a local study between Agua Caliente in, in the valley and Machu Picchu by Victor Carlotta. Whom you will see, uh, Victor is a, a geologist from the IGP, Instituto Geophysical del Peru. And finally, recently in 2019, Roaldo Menegat from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul did a very extensive studies extending the geographical, geographical uh, zone to 100 or maybe 150 kilometers. And uh, he said, he proposed that uh, a solution which is now accepted everywhere, that the intensive network of faults of different orientation caused intensive fracturation of the granitic batalite. And so providing blocks of, let's say, manageable size at the surface in what uh, he calls natural forests. So here is uh, a, another view from the wine picture, and you can see here the place where the blocks are still there. In geological terms, we call the granitic curves. This is a closer view of the uh, blocks and uh, which are on top of, uh, of the zone. Again, here we have an idea of how the Incas broke the stones to a size we really want. They pushed mm, some wooden pieces wet. And so when we froze, we broke the rock down. And the Incas were master stone workers, so they carved the, the stones to perfect sight, perfect shape, in a way that, that in a wall or any construction, the blocks would be fit so tightly on one another that it is impossible to, um, <clears throat> to put even a piece of a sheet of paper. I tried with a ticket from the Paris metro line and did not succeed either. So this is an example of a wall in uh, Machu Picchu. The, the, the different blocks fit together in a perfect way. Some sort of jigsaw pattern. And uh, when, when the earthquake occurs, the local saying is that the, the stones dance and after the earthquake, they fall back to the original position. So this is a, some sort of anti-seismic structure, a technique which is called ashlar or dry stone. Another example of a wall at uh, Lantaimbo, you can see how perfectly the different stones fit together. The most known is the 12 corners rock at Cusco. You, we, we can count the 12 corners. And here on top, the free windows temple, which you have already seen is also an example of how nicely, uh, tightly, the different 
blocks with different rocks were put together. We could have had a flat surface here, but we had uh, an additional corner here so that the building was much more stable. So this is how the Incas took advantage of a local structural geology to choose the locality for much picture. So can we think that the Incas had the knowledge of a structural geology of a Machu Picchu area? Certainly, most certainly not in the modern meaning of the term, the term structural geology. But we were certainly aware of faults. Linguists have identified the word Kiyo in their original language, which means fracture. And the Incas most probably knew that uh, the faults are linked to water seeps. And this is why most archaeologists believe that they locate a fractured zone by falling with seeps from down in the valley up to the Machu Picchu location. And yeah, we get to the second geological, actually hydrological factor or an essential reason for the construction of Machu Picchu. Water. Machu Picchu hosted between 600 and 1,000 years. So, of course, they needed drink, drinking water and also water for their home use. And here is the moment where we have to consider the existence of a spring, which I mentioned in the Machu Picchu, Machu Picchu mountain. And of course, the this uh, spring, single spring, was announced by a well, very impressively engineered collection system. This uh, uh, comprises a series of long, of under uh, of long canals and an impressive sequence of sixteen stone-lined fountains. And this was sufficient for drinking and for ceremonial, ceremonial and domestic waters cascading through the seat. Yet, the Incas said to, so they, had, they chose this uh, place because of the super geology allowed them to have uh, blocks of uh, manageable site and because the water, the spring, allowed them to have uh, enough water for domestic and ceremonial use. But they had to face, they had to face a seasonable precipitation, which could have been very, can be today also very impressive sometimes. 150 to 150 centimeters per year, and they would come in a certain way. So if nothing had been done, the construction of Machu Picchu would have been washed down. But the Incas built, they had to build an efficient drainage system. And sorry. Yeah. So that two thirds of a city are underground. And the first step, of course, consists towards the construction of stabilizing terrace. These terrace are built in such a way, first, a very strong and well attached wall was built, then they, they first put a strata of boulders, then gravel and soil, on the fertile soil 
or mulch. Mulch is a term which is a soil full of organic material. And this structure there had uh, made the water uh, move very slowly, so with minima, minimum erosion and allowed the the, the, the city to be there. So it is now time to show the second uh, video of my presentation. Here it is. The, this is the Inca Trail coming to Machu Picchu from Cusco. Still, you can use it. It's a four or maybe five days walk from Cusco and it arrives here in the upper part. Of, uh, of Machu Picchu, and uh, you can see, so this is the main entrance in Machu Picchu, you can see here the cows on the northern side, this is uh, the bridge which now exists of the Urubamba, and this is called the Bingham Highway, here you can see the Machu Picchu fault, and Luckily enough, you don't have to walk up all the 700 meters. Buses do it for you. And it is a long way anyhow. So we arrive at the point where the Bingama Way joins the, the Inca Trail. And then we move around in town. This is the view from the Huayna Picchu. Some people think that uh, Machu Picchu looks like a condor with a head here. I, I don't know. This is the classical view of Machu Picchu with Huayna Picchu with our construction up to here and the this is the place from where I took the video we have just seen. And we can visit again the, the town. There are no roof because this were um, um, made of vegetables and have been washed away. This is uh, one of the fountains. As I said, there are 16 of them distributed all over the city of Machu Picchu. Uh, yeah, the second one, I will not show all of them, but at least four or five of them to show that the water is still uh, coming and very clear. It is drinkable water. Actually, I drank years ago and uh, I'm still alive, so uh, it means that uh, it is a good quality water. Very clear. And this is built into a granitic block which the Incas carved. Uh, I don't know how they could do this. Again, this you have seen in the first one of the first slides of the first movie, sorry. Here the water is pouring through at rather good rate. It has been so for the last 500 years, despite the town, the city was abandoned. And as soon as the vegetation was taken out, the fountains started again. Here is a view of uh, Victor Carlotta pointing to the cows, explaining how this was used for the construction of Machu Picchu. The, here you can see the principal temple we, we have already seen and the rest of the town. And now it is, this is a place where the Incas had their agricultural plantation. You 
main view of the cars of the different blocks, which are evidently were not used with this one. And uh, we move again to the principal temple, which uh, Victor indicates. Here it is. And uh, part of it has been damaged, not because the wall was not strong enough, but because the soil was not strong enough. And on the right side, as uh, Victor explained to us, this huge stones were not, uh, were carved in this way because that allowed uh, transportation more, more easily. It is not because the Incas did not succeed in carving them. Well. Sorry, it is a little bit too long. Now we go on the back of this wall here. And uh, this is the top of much picture. Here is the back. You can see that uh, despite the, the that the ground was not strong. Well, here is a, a group of people who are the students, the teachers attending the oh, sorry, attending the gift to a two hundred two thousand and Twelve gift workshop in Cusco. Again, we see the, the Temple of the Sun with a trapezoidal window. And finally, we get to the top of Machu Picchu, and this is the Intihuatana uh, rock, the one you have seen already in the first video. Sergeant Carrasco was. Uh, staying close to it. Now we have a closer view, the final slide. You can see that uh, this rock is strange. You can see that there is some shade projected by the rock itself. But there are two particular days, the summer and the winter solstice, where the rock does not project any shadow. So how is this possible? Because uh, Machu Picchu is not on the equator. It is 30 degrees, 13 degrees south. So this, this is only possible if the entire Intawana, Intawana rock is cut with an angle of 13 degrees with respect of the horizontal. And also if you project this direction here, you get to a point where the sun rises. If you project the other side in the other way, you get to a point where the sun sets during the two equinox. So the Incas were not builders of city. They were also astronomers, sorry. Now, this is the end of my talk. If you wish to know some more, I encourage you to read the original book by Iram Bingham. There is a centenary edition, which is available today for a few euros or less. Um, which means thank you. This is the end of my talk. Steve, it's up to you.
Steve. Thank you so much, Carlo. I asked Steve to activate his video and microphone. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your very interesting talk. I had a look of the chat, but it seems that there are no questions. But if someone is interested in learning something more, you can uh, write your, your question on, on the chat and Carlo will be very happy to, to answer. I have one question, Carlo. It's very, yeah. it's very easy. Uh, can you repeat, please, ciao? How do you say the, the word, the title of the book? Can I say what? No, the, the title of the book that you say yeah, that it is called uh, Philosophy of uh, Incas. Okay. By Iram Bingham. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Everyone in the chat is very happy about the, the presentation, just to say you. They have, they have no question, but they, they are very happy about the, the presentation. Um, I think that Steve has some problems because I say that he's no more in the, in the call. Yeah. So we will wait a little bit to, to see uh, what, what happened. And um, okay. Here is Lost, Lost City of Incas. Okay. And I really think that uh, this is a, a fantastic, fantastic book, romantic and uh, attracting exploration. I'm in, in love with, uh, with uh, Machu Picchu, as you can imagine. I wish I could go there again. Okay, do you think it, uh, it's also good for the students to be read or is it too complicated book? No, 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 it's very easy to read. Oh, okay. Perfect. I could have read it when I was uh, 14. It's a wow. kind of a, a book I, I really enjoyed. Very easy to read. No problem. No problem okay. at all. So we can Of suggest course, he did not know about the structural geology problem. Oh. He described his exploration and his uh, fight to get funds to uh, clean it up from the vegetation and to no, it's really a good book. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for this interesting suggestion. Uh, I cannot find Stephen in the chat, but I will try to go ahead with our next speaker, who is, sorry for my bad pronunciation, Yannick Davos. Yes. Okay, I, I pronounce you quite well your your name I'm yes sorry. you did great you did great <laughs> okay, perfect uh, you have the right as co-organizer so you can share your screen if you want try to try to. is this working okay perfect so mm, i'm going to present you i'm sorry it was a, like a surprise for me to have to present and you're going to talk about a very interesting topic, urban geochronology in Belgium. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Please go, Yannick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the legacy of urban soils and sediments. Now, I'm a geoarchaeologist. And that basically means that I apply methods and principles from the earth sciences and from archaeology, and this in order to study past interactions of humans and their environment. Now, in this presentation, I would like to show the potential of urban soils and sediments to understand past urban development and also how we can come to a better understanding of how people were actually interacting with the environment in urban areas in the past. Now, yeah, it's working. Soils and sediments are an essential part of towns and they typically remain hidden from view and they basically only surface 
during road construction or demolition works, and that also implies that they do not get the attention they deserve. Nevertheless, urban soils have many different functions. And for now, I would like to focus on one specific function, and that is the memory of urban soils. Because for me, as a geoarchaeologist, the soils and sediments themselves are the object of my study. Now, why are these urban soils and sediments so important for archaeologists? Well, there are several reasons. The first one is that all the archaeological objects that we find during an excavation, well, they are surrounded and protected by the urban soil. And I give you some examples here. This is an excavation of uh, the ancient harbor of Brussels uh, in late medieval times. And what we see here are all these wooden posts that are still nicely preserved within the sediments that have been deposited by the local river, which was the Senna River. And another picture here is also from the historical center of Brussels. Um, and this time we are in the neighborhood where in medieval times all the butchers were situated together with a lot of other artisanal activities. And what we see here are basically hundreds, if not thousands of mandibles, jaws basically, of animals, mostly cow and sheep, that were broken in two to extract the oil and then were deposited within the soil and preserved until we excavated it a few years ago. From this same archaeological site, we have here a nice soil profile and where we see basically all these fragments of brick, again, nicely preserved within the urban soil. So we can say that the urban soil serves one way or another as a kind of container that preserves the objects inside. But it's not always true. We have to be careful about it. For instance, uh, these wooden posts were only preserved because they were preserved in permanent wet conditions so that biological activity did not get the opportunity to decompose the wood. But in many sites, all the wooden or even organic plant remains, they are quickly decomposed and they are no longer part of the story that can be found during an excavation. And the same goes also for the, these bone fragments. They were nicely preserved because we were dealing with a calcareous soil, a soil in which the bone material could be preserved but many soils are very acid, and that implies that the bone material will decompose very quickly, and so the bone remains would disappear. So that's something that we should always be careful about. Now, a second reason is that soils and sediments can also directly witness of ancient activities. And I'll show you an example from the same site and now we're not talking about the objects, but we are talking about these grayish traces that you can see here. And these are what we call implement marks. These are marks that have been made by spit. So people have been spitting the earth, doing agricultural activities. And what we see is that even after 700 years, because this site dates about, uh, from about 1300, um, so even after 700 years, we are still able to observe these traces, and that also implies that we can identify the activity that was performed there 700 years ago. The third point is that soils and sediments can also witness of landscape evolution, and I show you very quickly here three profiles uh, from the historical center of Brussels showing different episodes, basically, where we first have an area that was still covered by forest. And then we have a typical profile indicating medieval agriculture. And then the most recent part where you really see this urban soil appearing. So witness also of landscape evolution. And also an important 
factor is that soils and sediments are also a resource. And this is not only true for today, but also for people in the past. People were using sands, silts, and clays as construction material. Hey, here you can see an example of what will endure construction, but also for the making of bricks and ceramics. So also uh, soils and sediments as a resource. Now, to use the words of one of my mentors, we can basically compare a soil with a book. And I would warmly like to invite you to read together with me a few pages of this book of urban soils. Now, the first step we need to do is to open the book. And for that, we need to dig. And over the last decades, I've had the opportunity to study a lot of archaeological sites in the historical center of Brussels, just to orient ourselves a bit. So in green, we can basically see the surroundings of the first city wall, which was built uh, in the 13th century. And about 50 years later, people have been building a second city wall, which is indicated in red. Now, all the dots that you can see are excavations where we were able to perform a geoarchaeological study. The ones in yellow have been fully studied. The ones in blue is still very much work in progress. But you can see it's quite a dense grid, giving us quite some detailed information as we will see later on. Now, if we are talking about urban archaeology, well, sometimes we are facing enormous and spectacular excavations. And this is an excavation of a few years ago uh, in the historical center of Brussels, uh, where an ancient parking lot was demolished for the construction of a new administrative building. And so you can see the surface that was excavated was enormous. And what we found there were the remains of the ancient harbor of Brussels in medieval times. It was quite a spectacular excavation, but not all the excavations in the historical center are that spectacular. These are what I would call the more typical ones. And these are all these small trenches, sometimes only a few square meters large, quite often very deep. But all these small trenches together are providing us with a tremendous amount of information. So it's not because they are small that they are not interesting. Now, we've been working quite a lot in Brussels, but also had the opportunity to study in other towns in Belgium, especially in Flanders. So there are quite some excavations in the historical center of Ghent in Antwerp, and also had the opportunity to go to Leer, to the, old, to the oldest town in Belgium, which is Tongeren, uh, dating already from Roman times, and also Vilvoorde, Aalst, Oudemer, and Ypres. So quite a lot of different towns where I had the opportunity to have a look at the urban soil. Now, and the first thing that we see when we open this urban soil is complexity. Huh? We see a tremendous amount of layers, one cutting through the other. It's not really a surprise because we are facing several generations of occupation, one after the other, each time creating new deposits, demolishing part of the previously existing stratigraphy. So we end up with something which is very complex. And a colleague of mine tends to compare urban stratigraphy with the severest type of hedges that an archaeologist can face. And it's maybe not so far from the truth. And Within this complexity, there are a few types of layers which are extremely difficult to interpret based on field data. And the first type are what we call dark earth. And these are these thick deposits that do not really show any internal stratigraphy. So they're very thick, very homogeneous, and they cover wide surfaces. And they are really very difficult to interpret based on field data. And the other type is quite the opposite. That are what we call microstratified layers. And here, these layers are only a few millimeters thick. And that also makes it quite difficult to distinguish them and even more difficult to interpret them based on field data alone. 
And that's basically where geoarchaeologists come into play. And well, I will now take you to the historical center of Antwerp, which is situated in the north, northern part of Belgium here. So this is the historical center of Antwerp. This was an excavation that took place uh, in 2009. And so there were quite some spectacular discoveries. So we had a nice preservation of all types of organic material. There was a discovery of a medieval trackway. There was the earthen rampart of the first city wall of the town. So there were quite some spectacular findings. But the archaeologists also discovered this kind of succession of very thin layers, one on top of the other, about 100 different layers were discovered like that. And well, if we have a look at the dating of these layers, then we see that they only cover a period of about 100 years. So in a quite short time span, they have been developed. And of course, the question was, what are we facing here? And how can we study this? And that's where micromorphology comes into place. And micromorphology is basically the study of soils and sediments in what we call their undisturbed state and at a microscopic level. Now, what do we mean by saying in an undisturbed state? Well, that means that we are taking samples, specific block samples, where we really take a block of soil out of a profile. Uh, we put an orientation on it so that we know which part is up and which part is down. And then we impregnate this with resin. We cut off a very thin slice of about 0.02 millimeter thick. And that's something that we can then study under a microscope. And what's interesting about it is that we can observe all the components in their original position. So we can, for instance, see the pores. Yeah? You can see different types of pores here. You can see the minerals of which the sediments are composed. You can see all kinds of inclusions. And here we have fragment of dope. We have some charcoal fragments here. But we can also identify ancient uh, excrements. This is probably an excrement of a, hum uh, uh, of a human being, yes. And then we also sometimes even see parasite eggs. So there are quite a lot of things that we can observe. So the interesting thing about micromorphology is that we can observe everything in its original position. So there's no concentration of different elements. Everything is still there. And basically it's the continuation of what we already observe in the field, but at a different scale, this time at a microscopic scale. And this is very interesting for the, these very tiny layers because now we can study them in detail. And just to show you an example of one of these layers that we've been studying. So this lowest part here, we took a block sample. And well, to give you an idea, it's about eight centimeters uh, high and about four or five centimeters large. And what you can see here is that you have two clearly different deposits. Huh? The lowest part and the upper part, they're quite easily distinguishable. And they also testify of different kinds of activities. The lowest one is basically a floor, a floor of a house. No, we're not there yet. Well, the upper part is uh, basically the remains of a stable. So we see all the fodder that has been accumulating there, all the organic plant remains. You can still see they're nicely horizontally oriented. So basically by looking at this, what we call thin section, um, we can already distinguish two different layers and not just two different layers. We can also see a succession of activities. Huh? First, we have this house floor within a domestic floor, and then we have later on a stable. If we go to the upper part of the sequence, we can again see different layers appearing. And here we have at the lowest part, again, a floor from the domestic house. And for the upper part, we see an accumulation of ashes. This is made of pure ash. So basically 
by performing this micromorphological study, we can identify the succession of events. And we can also see how this one single location is modified over time and what people have been actually doing at this location. So this is quite an interesting sequence that we were able to identify there. Now, if we have a look at urban dark earth, then it's of course a totally different story that we are going to tell. Now, coming back to what are these urban dark earths? Well, it's basically an expression that is used by archaeologists to indicate the fact that they are facing these homogeneous, thick, dark colored layers that are often rich in human materials and cover large surfaces. And here you can see a nice example of this. Um, well, they are occurring all over Europe. Eh? You can see an example from Aquileia in Italy. There's another example here from London, uh, another example from Strasbourg. And just to give you an idea, all the countries in blue are basically countries where these dark earths have been studied in quite some detail. So it's really a European problematic. And well, if we look at it in detail, then of course the first question that we ask ourselves is, what are we looking at? It looks grayish. Uh, you don't see any layering in it. What does it represent? Is this just a leveling layer? Is there something going on? We have no clue. And well, in the past, the idea was these layers were considered to be of no archeological interest. So the idea was, we try to get rid of them as quickly as possible. But of course, that also implies that we are destroying part of our heritage without even looking at it. So that's maybe not the best idea. So in the next step, uh, well, the archeologists proposed, let's see these deposits and let's have a look what's inside. And we get some very interesting results because now we can, in a very detailed way, say, what are the archaeological remains that are inside of these dark earths? So we know something about the content, but we still have no clue on how these dark earths were formed, nor what are the human activities that are related to these dark earths. So for that, we need basically a geoarchaeological approach. And it already starts in the fields by performing detailed observations and taking the necessary samples. Then there's, of course, a step of performing the necessary chemical analysis and, of course, also micromorphology. Yeah, I've already shown the example of the application of micromorphology for these very thin layers, but we can also apply it to dark earth, as we will see now. I propose to go now to the town of Oudenaarde, also situated in Flanders. And then we had discovered this dark earth here. You see it's about 30 centimeters thick. And yeah, the question was, what is this? How can we study it? And well, we took a series of block samples. You see already a block that has been taken there, but we also took a block down here. And here you can see the thin section that we made out of that block. And well, while in the field you can't see any stratigraphy or any layers, if you look at this thin section, which is again eight centimeters high and six centimeters wide, you can immediately see a dozen of different layers. And that's basically part of the strength of micromorphology. We can make the invisible visible. And well, we performed quite some studies on these dark earths in Flanders and in Brussels, and it allowed us basically to come to a better understanding on how they formed. And what we basically see is that it all starts with parent material on which different factors are intervening. And then we are thinking about environmental factors such as climate topography, non-cultural processes, and then we are talking about Biotubation, biotubation meaning earthworm activity, ants, 
moles, which are all digging their galleries, but also plants and the roots. Uh, erosion can also be involved. Uh, sometimes if the soils are bare, they are vulnerable to erosion. Uh, you can also have decomposition of organic material that's inside. Uh, you can also have other types of soil processes that are involved. So that are basically what we would call the non-cultural processes. So we can also know, name them as natural processes, although part of them are, of course, caused indirectly by human activities. And then there are the direct human alterations or modifications. And then we are thinking about accumulation. Huh? Think about the adding of domestic waste, manure, cess, construction debris, industrial, artisanal waste, and so on and so further. You can also have the mixing of different materials. You can also have the removal or the digging away of part of, of the dark earth and also compaction can be involved. Hmm? And all that is also leading us to the identification of human activities. And that's what we basically see on this right part of this uh, image. And there you can see some of the activities that we were able to identify so far within this dark earth. So you see that it's not just one single activity leading to one dark earth. We have, for instance, um, the keeping of animals hmm, uh, on meadowlands. Uh, we also have the keeping of animals in, inside inside as a restricted area, so stabling. Um, we also have crop fields, gardens, market activities, building activities, quarrying, burial activities, and of course also artisanal activities. So quite a lot of different activities that can be involved. And what's also very important for this model that we developed is that you basically see that this dark earth, it, well, it, it's something that forms over time. And so I already said, it's not necessarily one single activity. Sometimes it's a succession of different activities, different non-cultural processes that are involved. So it's basically something that goes on and on and on until the dark earth gets sealed in one way or another. And that, of course, makes it quite complex to study, but also very interesting. And that brings us to basically the next point. By studying these dark earths, we can come to reconstruct a site of biography. So we can basically reconstruct the history of an archaeological site. Not just one event, but the whole chronological sequence. I will show you one practical example again from the historical center of Brussels. So here we have uh, the actual royal palace. And in this area was situated the palace of uh, Charles V. And next to this palace of Charles V, there was this uh, court of Hoogstraat uh, of one of noble uh, people from that from the 16th century. And well, we excavated part of the ancient gardens uh, a few years ago, and we were able basically there to find a very thick dark earth that we studied in quite some detail. And we were able basically to reconstruct a long story that goes back until the 10th century, where we are basically seeing that we are having some pasture land. Pasture land that is transformed in somewhere in the 10th, 13th century into a crop field. Uh, and this crop field, on top of these crop fields, uh, people were then building at the end of the 13th century a stable. The stable got destroyed, burned down, and then uh, people were adding a lot of construction debris, mostly construction debris and rubble, um, basically to create a new surface for the garden of this court of Hoogstraten in the 16th, 17th century. And well, today everything has become part of a museum that you can still visit today. So that's basically a whole site biography that we are able to identify. Now, identifying the biography of one site is of course quite interesting, but because we had so many different excavations in the center of Brussels, we can tell something more. 
uh, so based on the study of the soils and sediments, uh, we can try to reconstruct part of the early history of Brussels. And it's quite an interesting theme because for more recent periods, we have quite some detailed maps showing us the location of different streets and houses. But if we go back before the 16th century, these resources do not exist anymore. And if we go even further back in time to the early beginnings of the town development of Brussels, which is traditionally situated somewhere in the 10th century, well, there are no reliable written sources at all. So basically, it also implies that historians are now already for more than one century having these heavy debates, basically, on how did this town came into being and how did it develop, um, because, especially because of the scarcity of, of written sources. And that's basically where the study of the urban soil can help us quite a lot. So what we were able through the study of these soils and sediments was to map activities. So we were able to see that in the 10th, 12th century, there were quite some location in the historical center of Brussels, where we see that we are dealing with crop fields. We also have a lot of meadows, we have some quarries and even a lime kiln. And what's interesting is that we, well, forget about this first and the second city pole because they were not there yet. I told you they were built in the 13th century and the, one, the second one even 50 years later, but it's just a bit to orient ourselves. So this is basically the core area for the urban developments. And we see that within this core area, most of the activities, well, they are related to rural activities. So they're telling us that Brussels in this period is still very, rural in character and that was quite a discovery now when we have a look at the 14th 16th century ad then we see completely different picture appearing so again by looking at the urban soil we see that now we have a lot of gardening activities going on and what we also see that in all the sites basically that we studied for this period we see that construction activities are very much present. Likewise, metallurgical activities. We also see the appearance of marketplaces. So we have a very much, let's say, a more urban environment in this period. Where we, that's really something that is popping up at this period. And what we also see is the dis complete disappearance of these crop fields within this core area. Uh, when the historical center developed. So that's one thing that we can do through the study of the urban soil, but we can also say something about waste management and ancient pollution. And that is basically a huge problem according to historical sources. Huh? There are a lot of complaints about people throwing their garbage through the windows, uh, animals freely wandering throughout the city. Um, but it's, of course, very difficult to measure this. Um, and that's basically, again, where uh, soil science can be of very much importance. And so how can we now study ancient soil pollution? How can we quantify this? Huh? Can we get an idea about how important this pollution was. And that's something that we should be very careful about. Because if we are going to perform chemical analysis and measuring the presence of different elements, we have to be very careful. Because if you are performing chemical analysis, you're basically measuring the actual concentration of different elements and not necessarily the concentration within the 13th century or the 15th century, 17th century. So it's something that we should be very much aware about. And for that, we need to avoid a series of pitfalls. It's very important to know for one point, what is the background noise? Huh? What is the concentration of the different elements that are already present in a natural state without human interference? also perform what we call a taphonomical study. Yeah, we need to know what happened 
after the occupation of the site to know is there any recent pollution interfering. Uh, so these are really very important points that need to be treated first. But if you do that, then you can come to some reliable results. And so we, we got quite some interesting data about heavy metal pollution in different time periods. So first, again, have a look at this map of Brussels in the 10th, 13th century AD. And the first thing that we see here is that there is basically no pollution at all. We only have very slightly elevated concentrations of copper and nickel. Uh, and from that, it's even nowhere the case. And we were able basically to, to rely these slightly elevated concentrations to the agricultural activities and especially to the manuring of the soil in this period. Now, if we have a look at the 14th, 16th century AD, then we see a different picture. Now we see some more elevated concentrations. It's also a bit changing uh, according to the site we were excavating. And uh, it also goes for the different elements. Now, again, we were able to trace back the origins of the pollution, thanks to this combination of the chemical analysis with the detailed micromorphological study that we did. So we combined both and that helped us to identify the source. And so among the sources that were in identified for this pollution, there's of course metallurgical activities, no surprise there, but also horticultural activities, building activities and also burial activities. These seems to be the main uh, sources for pollution in this 14th, 16th century AD. Now, if we're going to have a look at the concentration or the elevation of this pollution, then we see that only in one single case the threshold values are reached. That means that in only one case there's potential harmful situation for the population. So that means that in pre-industrial times, heavy metal pollution was still very limited in this case for Brussels. And then, well, as a last point, I would like to, to tell something at a, diff, a bit different scale because we've been looking now at a very detailed scale, a microscope, almost a microscopic scale, but we can also tell something about the larger landscape through the study of these soils and sediments in Brussels. And uh, for that, I would like to present three more sites. First one, Tour and Taxi, Rue der Schot, and Rue des Boiteux. Uh, let's start with the site of Rue der Schot. What we discovered there, that was basically um, a very nice stratigraphy showing us the Senna River, so the local river in glacial times. What we see there is that there is no fixed bedding yet. So we have what we call a braided river, huh? where you have all these different channels, one crossing the other. So there's no one single big channel. So it's all very much moving throughout the landscape. So that's the situation in glacial times. And then we had another uh, excavation. I've already shown you the picture, I think, uh, Turin Taxi. Um, it's also situated in the historical center of Brussels. And what's interesting here is that we discovered a branch of the Senna River that was unknown to us and was dating from uh, Roman times. And what we see now is that we are dealing with a meandering river. And what's quite interesting is that we see that these Romans, they tried to fix the river in a bedding. So they did quite some wooden construction works to try to fix the bedding of the river. And so we also performed some additional studies showing us how the landscape looked like. And it was quite an open landscape that we had in these Roman periods. And we see, so again, going from a braided river, glacial times, Roman times, we have a nice meander. And what we see is that after abandonment of the site by the Romans, and so we are entering the fourth, sixth century there, then we see that we, that 
basically this this branch of the river got uh, blocked off from the main river, so there was no water streaming there anymore, and we got some kind of marshes there, a marshy area that slowly filled up until it completely disappeared from the landscape. Then the last site I want to show you is a site of Rue des Boiteux in the core center of Brussels. And why is this one interesting? Because here we found a very thick peat deposit. You can see it here. And so that's something that we tried to sample in quite some detail. Now, why is this peat so interesting? Well, because it's a sequence that covers um, the last 10,000 years. So it starts somewhere 10,000 years ago and it uh, lasts until the 13th century. And we have an almost continuous sequence there. So that's very interesting for us. Why is this peat so interesting? Well, in peat, the organic remains, so the plant remains, tend to preserve very well. So they can give us some idea about the evolution of the vegetation over the last 10,000 years. And what we did is we studied all the different types of remains. So we looked at the pollen, we looked at the seeds, we also looked at the sponge, the phytlids, so these are uh, silified plant remains, and also at diatoms. So quite a lot of different types of remains that we looked at in quite some detail. And that allowed us basically to look Eccomi, at the... sono la professoressa del Mastri. Eccoci. Niente, l'ho chiamata al cellulare perché ho capito che era in difficoltà col collegamento. Quindi eccomi qua, eccomi qua. So that allowed us basically to reconstruct um, the environment in quite some detail. It starts from 11,000 years ago where we have a, quite an open landscape. Uh, and then we go from 9,700 to 7,000. 800 years ago, where you see these reeds coming into place, then we get a more dense marshy area, so uh, more, more forested area uh, until 3,200 before present. And then yeah, you see that the landscape is opening again, probably uh, due to human influence uh, between uh, 3,000 and 1,000 before present. So that's basically something that we were able to reconstruct and it became also one of the reference sites for the whole region. Now, if we have a look at a more regional scale, then we see that we start um, with an area that is very open, a very open landscape with pioneering vegetation. So we get the first trees arriving, then we get the development of very dense forest, that get then later on partly cut until we have this open medieval landscape where we have all these crop fields that we were talking about previously. So what can we say in conclusions about these urban soils now? Well, I think I managed to demonstrate to you that the urban soils have a memory. They can help us to detect spatial organization patterns and also how they evolved over time. They helped us also to understand parts of this interaction between nature and the urban population. Think about uh, the changes in uh, the vegetation type, eh, where we go from forest into these, um, these more um, agricultural areas. And we can also obtain some objective data on the evolution of pollution in towns. And Finally, we can also understand part of the changes that are happening with the landscape. Think about relief, but also the riverbeds that are changing, vegetation, and so on. Of course, this kind of research is not just the work of one person. So I need to thank quite a lot of people who have been contributed to this research over the last 20 years. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to try to answer that. Thank you very much, um, Yannick. Um, there is uh, one uh, question from uh, Carolina Damianuska, uh, who wants to know um, 
do you use any physical methods to research uh, the age of what you study? Okay. Uh, um, for example, yes. radiocarbon dating yeah, for yeah, yeah. organic remains. Yeah. yeah. Uh, exactly. Yes, we do. Uh, so basically, uh, the dating of the soils is partly based on the archaeological material that we find because they can sometimes provide us with very detailed um, datings, huh? sometimes up to 20 years. Uh, on the other hand, we also are relying on uh, carbon-14 datings, uh, but this is sometimes a bit problematic because especially for this medieval period, we have sometimes, yeah, um, sometimes an uncertainty of about 100, 150 years. And of course, for medieval periods, this is quite a large period that we, uh, uh, quite a large uncertainty that we have to face with. So that's sometimes something a bit problematic, but we we're quite hard working. Right? But especially for these oldest phases of, uh, of, the, of the urban development, we do not always have that much archaeological material at hand to perform any dating on. So then we are indeed relying on the, the C14 datings, yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions to the speaker? I do not see any other questions in the chat. Okay, so Yannick, um, uh, thank you again for this very uh, interesting and uh, very well prepared talk about uh, the um, uh, urban archaeology and how <laughs> to excavate the human past in the uh, cities. Okay. I don't know if you call this field work or urban work. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to say. It's difficult to say, but there's a lot of field work involved, of course. Huh? Um, even if it's a very small trench, we always try to be there and to, to, to take our samples. So, so there's a lot of field work involved. But there's also a big part, which is afterwards the laboratory work, yeah? all the microscopic work that we have to do, the chemical analysis. So yeah, it's basically a combination of both. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now I think I'll uh, close this uh, uh, very nice session we had today. Um, I would also like uh, to thank uh, uh, Jean-Luc, who made uh, the first uh, uh, hands-on uh, activity uh, uh, talk and uh, uh, made this, this very nice uh, introduction about using um, um, in the classroom um, um, seismic uh, events of um, the past uh, in the city of Rome. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, 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 my old friend Carlo for his uh, very nice virtual tour to Machu Picchu. And since we all operate now virtually, <laughs> it is like is if we visited also uh, Machu Picchu uh, this year, uh, instead of visiting the um, a museum in Vienna, which we do when we have a, a live session. <laughs> um, um, so I wish everybody a nice afternoon and um, we'll convene again tomorrow at uh, nine o'clock in the morning, Central European time. And so, Goodbye, everybody, for today. Have a nice afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. <laughs>